on the full screen? Yeah. That's Can perfect. Change? Yeah. Okay. Right. Have a nice talk. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> so is it supposed to be roughly 15 minutes? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I mean, sure. No. Yeah. I'll probably stop even a little bit earlier if I can. Because there's a photo section afterwards. So yeah. Uh, this is flexible, but then also less like it's more helpful. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, people are more comfortable than they are. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, it's actually a great honor to talk here. <laughs> um, and, and I would like to thank uh, Christoph and uh, uh, Herbert for the kind invitation and for putting together a very nice conference, a very nice semester, in fact. Um, so what I will talk about today is some joint work with Lillian Pierce um, about the collagen operator and some outgrowth of the collagen operator. So this is an operator that was first studied in relation to a very classical question in analysis, namely that of a point-wise almost everywhere convergence of Fourier series. Um, I felt that this is uh, perhaps a good opportunity to uh, give some survey about what has been done and you know, how that leads to what uh, we, we are studying. So uh, part of the talk is like a survey. There, were, there will be three parts. The first part is like an introduction of what has been done and, and uh, that gradually leads to what, 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 what uh, the operator that we study. Uh, second part, uh, I'll just give some ideas about uh, time frequency analysis, which is one of the driving forces that, uh, that, that has uh, uh, been, been uh, 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 under intense study for the past uh, 10, 15 years. And then the finally come to some aspect of the proof of a theorem and I'll probably be brief over there. Okay, so first part. By the way, feel free to stop me if you have any questions. Uh, so. Uh, I'm just going to begin with uh, an integrable function f on the unit interval, write down its Fourier series. And uh, Fourier had the insight that perhaps every function can be extended as a Fourier series. So, of course, it took uh, the mathematicians a lot of time to uh, clarify and make precise this claim. Um, so, let's write Sn of f for the partial sum of the Fourier series. We know that if f is a little smooth, let's say c alpha for some alpha, then uh, you have pointwise convergence at every point on the unit interval. Um, if it fails, if f is just continuous, uh, the Fourier series should diverge at a point. If f is just an LP, let's say, for some p that's between 1 and infinity, you've got this convergence of the partial sums of your Fourier series to your function in LP norm, which in this is false and p is equal to 1. Uh, things go really wrong with L1. Yeah. L1 functions with Fourier series divergence everywhere. It goes back to the 1920s. Now, so the question that uh, we would be concerned about is uh, what if one is only interested in almost everywhere convergence of the Fourier series? This is, of course, a famous result of Carleton uh, and Hunt in, in the case of LP. Um, if F is an LP function where P is between 1 and infinity, then the partial sums of the Fourier series of F converges to F at almost every x in L1, uh, x in L1. Okay. So the proof proceeds by approximating a function F in LP by a smooth function. And uh, the key is to control a certain maximal operator, which has since been called a Carleton operator. This is the supremum uh, over all n of the partial sums up to uh, the term n of the function F. This operator is bounded on LP for all P between 1 and infinity. In fact, Carleton proved that uh, this operator is weak type Q2, and uh, Hunt proved that this is weak type PP for all P, and so it can be 
also will get a strong high charge field to the of the Later, Charlie Safferman and uh, Michael Lees and Christoph Spieler, uh, they gave very interesting alternative proofs, and these techniques have developed into a field you know, called time frequency analysis, and we can do some of that in, in the talk, in the second part of the talk. Okay. Now, here's a variant on our end. If we are interested in the Fourier integral instead of Fourier series, we can ask whether the integral of f hat c e to the 2 pi i x c dc from minus n to n would converge to f of x when n tends to infinity. This would require to study the analogous operator, which is the supremum over all n <coughs> of this uh, partial Fourier integral. Modules on trivial operators, well, trivial means identity. <laughs> One has to study, uh, or the Hilbert transform. One has to study the bound of this operator here. So you're transforming with one over y, but not just one over y, but e to the two pi i lambda y, where lambda is a real number, but it's like supremum over all possible real numbers. And uh, this is the operator that one starts to bound if you want to answer the question about Fourier integrals. Note that uh, what we have inside is the kernel one over y, which is of course the simplest how do one segment kernel when you have on, on real numbers. Now, we can take this question and put it in our end. We just begin with a Caldwell segment kernel K. Uh, pick your favorite one, let's say the Reese trans uh, the potent, um, let's say the Reese transform. Then you can perhaps transform with this kernel K, but you modulate by e to the i lambda y, and you take sup over all possible coefficients lambda in terms of your y. This is uh, the version of the Carlson operator that Stolin considered in the 70s. And uh, the, the result that he has is that this is bound on LP for all P in P to minus infinity. So all these are fairly classical. Now, one thing to observe here is that uh, what we have in this Carlson operator is exponential of i lambda dot y. And if you think of the phase lambda dot y as a function of y, this function of y is simply a linear polynomial in y. This is a linear function in y. Each Parameter lambda gives you a different uh, polynomial in y. And you're taking the sub over all possible linear polynomials in y in this operator. So there's the point of view that uh, uh, Eli Stein has taken uh, to get a state Granger, and uh, this is what I'm going to talk about next. In 2001, uh, Eli Stein and Steve Granger uh, they initiated the study of a variant of the Carlson operator, where the phase lambda dot y in the exponential is replaced by a real polynomial of higher degree in y. Okay. So what does that mean? Now, let PD be the set of all real polynomials of degree up to D on our end. And let's say PD prime is a subset of PD. So these are real polynomials of degree up to D. But we require these polynomials to vanish at the origin to order at least two something like y squared. Then we define the following variant of the Carlson operator. You still take a function f on Rn, you convolve with a singular integral kernel k on Rn, except that you put in the space vector e to the i p y. And you take the sub over all p this in this more restricted class of polynomials of degree d on Rn. If this is the operator, uh, then the, the result of Steinwenger is that this operator maps LP to LP boundary for all P that is strictly between 1 and infinity. Uh, they did this using stationary spaces. Okay. Well, this does not quite recover the original result of Carlson. This is uh, uh, a slightly different problem because, because uh, if you take just the linear phase lambda dot y, they only vanish to the, at the origin to order one, and as a, as a result, they're not even in this smaller class P sub D prime. Later on, uh, Victor Lee, using time frequency analysis, improved this result of Stein and Wenger, at least in dimension one and on the torus, by replacing this P sub D prime by a bigger class, by the full class P sub D. And if you allow the full class P sub D, this is a generalization of the Carlson field. So 
So uh, finally, we come to uh, this new joint work with Lydian peers. We study the variant of the theorem of uh, sine wing. In fact, this is a problem that Eli kindly posed to us a few years back, uh, where we introduce an additional red and transform in this, in this collision of the event. And uh, for completeness today, we're going to just focus on this problem in our screen. So we call the following. If k of y is a Caldron segment kernel on R2, and you have a function, a function f of xt on R3, where x is in R2, t is in R, then you can define the following operator, and there will be a singular rather than transform of f along the parabola. You just integrate over <laughs> all y in R2 of f of x minus y, t minus y squared, but you multiply by k of y dy. So it's a singular rad and transform. You're in integrating only over, over a lower dimensional submanifold, even though your function is defined on R3. The operator we study takes the following form, something very similar to what we have seen before. The crucial difference is that now you have this rad and type behavior here. You're integrating a function f of x minus y, t minus y squared, k of y, but you multiply by e to the i py dy, you're going to take the supremum over a suitable class of polynomials that we are going to specify next. So this is the form of the operator. The new thing here being the uh, integration over the parabola. Uh, okay, so it's class of polynomials of degree up to D on R2 that we will be talk about the next one. Okay, so more precisely, we're going to fix a positive integer d, we get an equal to 2, which I'm going to think of as the degree of the polynomials we allow. For each j that's between 2 and d, we will fix some polynomial p sub j of y on R2. So there will be d minus 1 of them. The pj would be homogeneous of degree j. And oh, okay, it's got real coefficients. So we fix d minus 1 polynomials like that. We form their linear span over R. So this gives me a vector subspace of the set P sub D prime, if you remember what they are. Uh, these are uh, like polynomials that uh, uh, form a D minus one dimensional space that vanish to uh, order at least two at the origin. And K sub Y is the Caldron segment kernel that I fixed on out to once and for all. The theorem that Lillian and I had is the following. If P sub 2 is not uh, just a multiple of Y squared for any non-zero constant C, then the operator they wrote down on the earlier slide is bound on LP for all P that is between 1 and infinity and all P. Here the supremum is taken over the span of these D minus 1 polynomials. By the way, some of you might have heard Lillian give a talk under a similar title uh, earlier this year. But I think our results have been proved since then, so maybe this is a bit too early to talk about this. Uh, in particular, now we allow like a more general set of polynomial spaces. Okay, so this is uh, the main result. Well, before I get into the discussion of how this uh, is proved, Maybe it would be a good idea to just uh, uh, pause a little bit and digress and talk about a little bit about time frequency analysis, just to put things in context. Okay, so basically what I want to say is some heuristics about how you go about proving Carlson theorem. And then well, I come back and say that this is not actually the way that we're doing it, because uh, there is a very good observation of Eli Stein and Steve Link that just allows us to treat things otherwise. Anyhow, so let's begin with this. Uh, oh, okay, so what is that? So let's begin with this theorem of Carlson. We are going to introduce two operators here. The <coughs> first is the partial sum of uh, your Fourier series over all little n is bigger than capital N. So this is an operator that depends on capital N, which I call x sub n, x for Hilbert. And uh, the strip C of f is going to be a sub over uh, all non-negative n of x sub n of f. 
if you want to prove Carlson theorem, this is equivalent to saying that the disoperate C maps L2 to the weak L2. Okay, so very easy. Uh, and this is uh, just a dot in a minute. So, well, in order to understand this operator C, which is sub of all the Hn of F, let's understand, first of all, one term. So let's fix N and understand Hn of F. Uh, it's going to be that there are going to be two decompositions that are involved. One is an orthogonal decomposition in frequency space. Another is uh, an orthogonal decomposition in physical space. So we're going to look at each of these. Okay. So let's take, first of all, the frequency space, which is, uh, we can think of as uh, uh, this axis here. Now, first, a dyadic interval is an interval of the form m minus 1, 2 to the k, <coughs> m 2 to the k, for some integers m and k. And for each k, for each fixed integer k, you have uh, these dyadic intervals of length 2 to the k, and they would tile the the real axis. For example, this is a tiling of the real axis with a dyadic interval of length one. This is a tiling of uh, the real axis with, with of, uh, dyadic interval of length two and so on. From this, it's clear that each dyadic interval will have a parent, so to speak. For instance, this interval here will have a parent, which is zero four over here on this side. And that would be a dyadic interval that contains your original dyadic interval and that is twice as long. So each dyadic interval omega will have a parent omega star, which is a unique dyadic interval that contains omega and that is twice as long. The key here is that for every integer n, we can decompose this interval n plus 1 to infinity into a disjoint union of dyadic intervals, which are indexed by k. Here, omega k n is a dyadic interval depending on k and n. It is either an empty set, of, okay, it's either an empty set or a dyadic interval of length 2 to the k. And the characterizing property of these omega k n is that if you take their parent, they're not going to be contained in this uh, interval from n plus 1 to infinity. Well, a moment's thought would reflect, it will reveal that you can do this. But I think it's more instructive to talk about some examples rather than give you the proof. So here's the case when n is equal to 0. When n is equal to 0, the interval that you consider is just 1 to infinity, which is this blue line here. And you see this is the tiling of dyadic, uh, by dyadic intervals of length 2 to the k. Okay. When n is equal to 4, then you take the interval 5 to infinity. You tile them by interval of length 1 and then 8 and then 16 and so forth. So you're shifting the 4 in each of these sections just to make it uh, the way that, uh, that you want to tell each dyadic interval. Okay, so you've got this dyadic decomposition of your frequency interval from n plus 1 to infinity. Now, pi, okay, so I'm going to define pi with respect to this interval of f to be the frequency projection on this dyadic interval, wherever it is. It's the sum of f hat n g to the 2 pi i n x over all the n's is inside your dyadic interval. Then h n of f is just a sum of all these frequency projections of f. And it's now helpful to draw a picture of what we call the time frequency plane or the x n plane. We think of x as time and n, the dual variable as frequency, to illustrate where Morally speaking, each of these terms is important. So that's the next slide. Here, on the left side, I've got a time frequency plane. I've got the product of the x interval, which is 0, 1, with the frequency interval, which is the set of all integers. And when I decompose x sub 0 into the sum of these uh, projections of f, I'm just projecting them onto each of the frequency bands. So each term in the sum is supported in one of these frequency bands that I have. Well, same for x4, when I project, I'm just projecting onto these frequency bands that uh, you have in the time frequency plane. So, so far I've not done much. It's just uh, essentially projecting onto frequency space. Next, we're going to decompose in the physical space. Okay, so I'm going to write the unit interval, 0, 1, 
as this Julian of q to the k dyadic intervals of q to the k, you know, this by, uh, of length q to the minus k, so you know, two dimensional way. It's a decomposition into q to the k intervals of equal length. I'm going to consider the characteristic function of the interval that I obtain in this manner, and I'm going to normalize that so that this is uh, something that has L2 norm equals to one, I'm going to call it psi KL. Then, since roughly speaking, this is not quite precise, but heuristics after all. Roughly speaking, the frequency projection onto a frequency band of uh, length Q to the K would be roughly constant on a physical scale of Q to the minus K. This is the variant of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. You, sh you could think of these size of KLs as almost bending uh, the, the set of all projections that you can get by projecting under this frequency space. And as a result, the frequency projection is almost an expansion in terms of these psi KLs uh, when, when L varies from 1 to 2 to the K. This bracket here is the L2 inner plus 1. Well, this is not quite right, but you know, morally speaking, this is what happens. Now, in this bracket, you can move the frequency projection itself at joint. You can move it to the psi KL, so that's OK. And then, since these are projections, if it were an equality here, you can apply a projection again on both sides. It doesn't change the left-hand side. But you would have an additional factor here on the right-hand side. If it were an identity, you would have that. So morally speaking, this x sub n is now a double sum. The first sum is a sum over frequencies. The second sum is a sum over physical space. And you have got f in a product against something. Okay. So again, it's best to see this in pictures. Here we go. When n is equal to 0, we have already earlier decomposed x0 of f as a sum over all k's. You know, remember all these frequency bands we had. What we're doing here is that we're just cutting the frequency bands into these rectangles. And the rule is that you should cut these rectangles so that they have area 1. So that if you have a length q to the k here, these intervals have length q to the minus k in the spatial direction. Same for n equals 4. Whatever decomposition in the frequency band you have, you just cut it into rectangles like that. In fact, we are going to call uh, a rectangle of area 1 uh, a tile, uh, not tile. We're going to call a dyadic rectangle of area 1 a tile. This is this sign the left side. A tile is a dyadic rectangle, meaning that it's a product of two dyadic intervals in the time frequency plane with area 1. We just saw that x sub n of f is essentially a sum over tiles. Um, you know, you have sum over k and l, and that corresponds to each term corresponds to uh, one of these rectangles here. In fact, morally speaking, each term is supported in one of these rectangles. And what happens is that essentially any tile could arise in the decomposition of x sub n of f for a suitable n. Essentially, this is what happens. Therefore, if you want to analyze the tiles in our operator, which is a soup over all n, then one starts to really ana analyze essentially the sets of all tiles in the frequency in the time frequency plane. But that's a lot of tiles. In fact, for each k, the sets of tiles whose dimension are q to the k must product q to the minus k. Or it is the other way around. q to the minus k product q to the k. Uh, they tile the time frequency plane. So k equals 1, you've got these tiles tiling the time frequency plane. k equals 2, you've got another tiling. k equals 3, you've got another tiling. So there's a lot of overlap between these things. And when they overlap, uh, the terms will no longer be orthogonal to each other. Therefore, one starts to deal with this. The good news is that not all tiles actually contribute. And you can organize these tiles, the tiles that contribute into something that is called tree. So you can organize them into Julians of something called tree. The cars and operators then sum over trees, and what happens is that each tree would give rise to an operator that's like the Hilbert transform. This is essentially a singular integral transform, and that's bound on LP for NAP. 
the point here is that you've got to exhibit orthogonality between the operators corresponding to different trees. So as to prove the full result of Paladin. And the three proofs that we have talked about earlier, namely that by uh, Nella Carlson, Charlie Pfefferman, and Michael Age and Christoph Peeler, they each have a different way of exhibiting this crucial uh, orthogonality. And this is uh, the main difference between their theories. But uh, uh, we have not entered into details here. We just want to say that, on the other hand, Steve, uh, uh, Eli Stein and Steve Winger, they, they have uh, an approach that does not require all this machinery from time critical analysis for their problem. And this is because they have a very elegant observation that allows them to exploit the additional oscillations they have in the polynomial phases that they consider. So the phases that consider are polynomials of higher degrees, and if you think about a polynomial that has higher degree, they have, they have more oscillations at infinity, and, and then uh, they will have some additional cancellation when, when this happens. What we have done, what Lillian and I have done, uh, is in a way a refinement of this approach of uh, Stein-Wenger, but we've got to take into account all the difficulties that is present when, when you have a rather than chance of a long parabola and when you integrate over a lower dimension or submanifold. Okay. So here we go. Remember, this is the operator that Lillian and I considered. Uh, it's an integral over the parabola, but you multiply by the single integral kernel k that you fix, and you integrate against exponential i p y with p some phase. We want to prove that uh, it is bound on L2 of R3. Uh, okay. So what we're going to do is just the following. In fact, if you look at this operator, when y is really small, then remember P of y is the polynomial that vanished at the origin at the very least. So P of y is going to be really small when y is small, and exponential IPy is roughly equal to 1 when y is very small. This suggests that uh, one should decompose the kernel k of y dyadically into sum of sum functions. Um, so sum of these sum functions where the k term is supported where y is roughly due to the k. And for, when you plug this into the operator, you will get a contribution from terms that have small k's and big k's. Those contributions from small k's corresponds to integration over y's that is sufficiently close to the origin in these these terms can be approximated by a maximal truncated singular rather than transform, which is very well understood. This is bound on LP. And you, know, uh, you knew basically everything about it. Okay. So the case when y is supported near the origin is fairly easy to deal with under the particular assumption that we have on our polynomial phases. Thus, we reduce to the terms where k is large. And this is just a schematic way of saying what happens. When k is large, you're integrating over large values of y. There, the phase p of y oscillates very rapidly. Remember, this is a polynomial of high degree. And then the, this would give us, this is the main thing that we're going to explain for the rest of the talk. We're going to gain some decay in k that allows us to sum over large values of k in the previous slide. So this is the essence of the matter. Um, so we reduce to a theorem on the next slide, which, by the way, is interesting on its own. Um, so let's look at, uh, well, this is, a first of all, a piece of notation. If you have a polynomial p, which is a polynomial in, OK, if you have a polynomial p in y, uh, the isotropic norm of this polynomial is just the sum of all the coefficients corresponding to y to the alpha, but you require that alpha is bigger than equal to 1 meaning they've got to drop the constant term of your polynomial. That is a way of measuring how oscillatory your polynomial is. OK. Well, this is a separate new theorem now, uh, if you can follow what happened earlier. If eta is a bump function supported in the unit ball, uh, fix the polynomial take the degree n, the de degree d for the set of polynomials we consider. Now, for each p, 
each k, we're going to define operator i, p, k of f as follows. This is a convolution, so it's almost a right and transform along the paraboloid, except that this time in place of your tau drawn segment kernel, you just put in this dilation of a bump function eta. Okay. And you've also got d to the i, p, q to the minus k, y. So for each polynomial phase p and for each scale k, you can define operator i, p, k as such. We are going to consider the following operator. We take the absolute value of i, p, k, we sub over all k's, and we sub over all polynomial phases that has uh, oscillation or norm equal to r. Okay. We understand this operator better in a moment, but the main claim here is that this, this operator, which depends on r, on the size of the coefficients here, is bounded on L2 uh, with norm that decay as the power of R as R tends to positive infinity. Okay. So how should we understand this operator? Now, first of all, if, uh, if we fix a polynomial P and we pick absolute value of this integral up here, one trivial way of estimating this integral is we can put absolute value inside the integral, in which case we get rid of this exponential i p. In that case, when you sub over k, when you sub over the scales k, this is essentially just the maximal right and transform. In fact, you can do this even with the supremum in p, right? You can just put the absolute value inside the integral, and then you get something that's independent of p, and you're just sipping over k here. So this is an operator that's dominated at every point by the maximal right and transform of f, which is, of course, bound on L2, that's well known. So the key here, the essence of the theorem here, is that uh, we've got a bound on L2 that has a norm that's very small as R tends to infinity. This is what we want to gain. Well, but in order to understand this, let's try to look at the toy model first. Earlier, in this operator, I've got a parameter r, and I'm going to sub over both k and p. In this slide, I'm going to drop the supremum in k and sub only over p. It's the same operator. In fact, for, for, for simplicity, I'm going to set k equals 0 and sub only over p. Okay. If you want to prove the previous theorem, at least you have better know that when you drop the sub over k, you still got an operator that's bound on L2 with a norm that's small. Turns out, this we can do using stopping times and TT star. Okay, so this is what the explain. This is the operator again. Uh, it's the supremum of an appropriate class of polynomials of i p zero f of x p. At every point x p, the supremum here is almost attained by a possibly different polynomial that varies that depends on the point x of x comma t. So let's call this polynomial p subscript x comma t. This is a polynomial in y, but that depends on x and t. We consider the linear operator p sub f, which is what you get by plugging p sub x p into your polynomial phase. This is a linear operator on f. And if you want to prove that this maximal operator is bound on L2, then this is the same thing as showing that t is bound on L2. And if you want uh, maximum operator to have a small norm that is the same thing as showing that t is bound on L2 with a small norm. Since t is now a linear operator, and this is the whole point of doing it, when you want to prove the linear operator is bound on L2, you just need to look at the, the edge on t star of the operator and you look at tt star. If tt star is bound on L2, then you're done. This is desirable because tt star usually exhibits more cancellation than that of p, and this is when this is in the following manner. Remember t of f is this integral over two dimensions, uh, wherever that is. And uh, t star of f is an integral, another integral over two dimensions is well got r. Uh, I don't really want you to follow all these formulas here. All that I want, here, want you to observe is that tt star of f is then given as an integral over four spatial dimensions because we've got four dimensional integral here. Now, f is a function of three variables, so you can almost write tt star of f uh, as a three-dimensional convolution against a convolution kernel. What happens is that 
the convolution kernel will then be a one-dimensional integral because you have one dimension that is left when you integrate. And it turns out that this one-dimensional integral kernel will be an oscillatory integral at that very thing. In fact, okay, it's written down a formula here, but never mind. Uh, this is f, uh, gp star of f equals the integral of f of x minus u, t minus u squared, which is the minus q u tau at, as well. And then it is some kernel here that depends on u and tau, the integral over u and tau. This kernel depends on two polynomials, p1 and p2, where p1 is the polynomial that you have at the stopping time x comma t. P2 is the polynomial, but at a different stopping time, which is where the function is evaluated when you integrate. So you do have an integral kernel. The only thing that I want to say is that this integral kernel here is a one-dimensional oscillatory integral. Uh, it's an integral of one dimension. You see some faces over here. These are polynomial faces. And then that's where we gain. Uh, the but right here, we can already see some difficulty that arise when we have rad and transforms coming up. In particular, while t of f is given as an integral over two dimensions, the kernel k sharp that you obtain by doing tt star is only a one-dimensional integral. And we know that the, the higher dimension you have, uh, the more oscillation you have uh, in oscillatory integrals, the better decay you have. The decay of an oscillatory integral has a lot to do with the decay, uh, has a lot to do with the dimension of the underlying space over which you're integrating. So that means we have less oscillations in the integral defining k-sharp compared to the standard space. And that says that the method of tt star is less effective in the rare than case. In fact, it is precisely for this dimension tau that we've got this state of theorem for functions f that is defined on R3 but not on R2. We can ask the same question for functions f that is defined on R2, but, but, then, but then the kernel that you'll get is not even an integral to begin with, not to say, not to mention Anyway, but we can still hope to gain something non-trivial from the oscillatory nature of the integral defining the k-sharp, uh, the kernel that we have. Uh, in fact, there's the first of all trivial bound, which I'm not going to show you, but the, the trivial bound is very simple. It just says that it's bounded by 1, and it's supported by u and tau uh, bounded by 1. As a result, if you just plug this bound trivially into the expression of tt star, this is what you get. You're integrating f of x minus u, t minus u squared minus q u tau, and this, this is the function of the board uh, in u and tau, d u d tau. So you want to prove that this is bounded on, the left hand side is bounded on L2, and that's very easy. You just put the L2 norm everywhere inside the integral uh, in dx dt. Of course, then you just integrate, and it's got something that's bounded on L2 with norm 1. But that is not what we want. We need to do better. We want something that decays. We want the norm to decay like a power of r as r tends to infinity. So we've got to have a better estimate for our kernel and uh, that we do using math of stationary phases. I should mention that this is exactly here where we use the assumptions that we have on the polynomial phases from a specific class. If we can improve the following lemma, we can improve our results. Okay, so what does this say? If you have two polynomials from a specific class and they have uh, norm roughly equal to r, then the claim is that the, the kernel will be bounded by the sum of three terms. The first term is extremely good. It is the characteristic function of the board multiplied by a very small number when r is big. And then, so if, if we had only this term, then we'd be done. But then there are two more terms that says that this is probably not true. You don't you don't have a bound that's like r to the minus q delta if u is in one of these exceptional sets that depends on the polynomial p sub 1 and if tau is in one of these exceptional sets that depend on the polynomial p sub 1 and u. Anyway, the point here is that these, small ex these exceptional sets are small in size. They have small measures. So roughly speaking, this estimate says that for most u and tau, you do have a good bound that's like r to the minus q delta for your uh, kernel. K sub Q tau. That would allow us to finish uh, this off. In fact, we just got to plug it and do some trivial estimates. In fact, yeah, it's pretty standard, so I'm not going to say much about that. 
it's important here that we get small exceptional sets GP1 and FG1U that are independent of P2. So one of the points of the previous slide, which I kind of uh, got over just now, was that these sets are independent of P2. Otherwise, we would run an estimate of this kind. So we would have integral of f of x minus u, t minus u squared, t u tau. And then you have this characteristic function here. Now, let's say that you want to try to integrate over tau. You see a tau here, you see a tau here. That's almost like a maximal function in the last variable of f, if you wish. But look, the small set here that actually depends also on tau, and it's not clear how you can handle this integration when, when, the, when the small set depends on tau. Anyway, this is a small technical point, and that's, uh, that's uh, what kept us from having a more general theorem. So that's the model case. Now, uh, to conclude, I'm just going to say something about uh, the full case, which is the case when you not only consider sub over p's, but also sub over k's. Uh, well, naively, you might hope to adopt also a stopping time in the k as well, and do tt star. But this is no good because even without the sub in t, even if you're just taking sub over k, in which case you're just dealing with the maximal right and transform, the standard one, this method would fail. So we start to proceed differently. We start to introduce a smoother variant of this operator and estimate a square function. Uh, here we go. Maximal function is sub of IPK. IPK is the right and transform. So instead of the right hand transform, we've got a version JPK. Uh, I think for the sake of time, don't worry about too much about what this actually is. Uh, the only thing is that it's integral over R3, so it's a smoother variant of the IPs, and there's some translation property between the IPs and the JPs. So what I want to say is that the, this maximal function that we want to estimate originally is sub over I's. But we could say that it's sub over p's plus the sub of difference between i and p, which would then bound by a square function here. So the sub over k can be replaced trivially by the square function in k. The first term is known to be bound on L2 with a small norm. This is an easy modification of the argument of p1 and p, uh, because this j doesn't have any right hand behavior in it. The second term is a square function, and we want to prove that the square function will have a norm that decays uh, 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 in L2, uh, that, that, that is bound on L2 with a norm that is small when, when all the parameters we have is large. So here we have the square function again. We want to prove that it's bound on L2. Um, the, the upshot here is that, the function again, this i minus j is somehow adapted to the frequency 2 to the minus k. So morally speaking, this thing should act only on the part of f that has frequency 2 to the minus k. This means that we do have to do a decomposition of f in the frequency space. We don't need to decompose it in physical space. At least we need to decompose it in the frequency space. And we hope to gain something that's like a translation between uh, the frequency of f and the frequency of this operator that's 2 to the minus more precisely, we hope to find some appropriate little petty projection, delta j, so that f is submission delta j of capital Fj for some suitable function, capital Fj, that is perhaps frequency localized, and uh, we want this natural L2 bound. And more importantly, we want the following theorem that says that if we take Ipk minus Jpk multiplied by delta j of f, the one that we had on the earlier slide, when j and k are very different, you want this operator to be bounded on L2 with a norm that decays when j is very different from k. The key here are some translation properties. We have some translation property of between i minus j earlier already that is used uh, in one of the cases here. But uh, when the frequency of delta j, which is 2 to the minus j, is bigger than that of the frequency of the earlier term, uh, i minus j, pk, then uh, we need a cancellation property from delta j, and the question is, what cancellation property do you need, and how do you exploit it? The first answer, uh, the, uh, the question, the answer to the first question turns out to be relatively nice. We just start to take delta j to be a little petty project in the last variable. 
but it's a little tricky to use, and I think this is the last thing I want to say. Uh, in fact, if you just look at the case, uh, the operator i p k delta zero, let's say k is very different from zero, you want to gain some translation between k and zero. One thing you could do is to write on the, the operator here. So you just spell out what the operator is. You want to gain something that's like 2 to the minus k from this operator. Even if, let's say, uh, the delta, the kernel here, has integral 0, which is the natural kind of translation property we expect of this kernel. Or let's say, equivalently, you could write delta as the derivative of something else. If you try to plug this identity into the delta and try to integrate by part, it's not very clear how you can do it, because if you just do it naively, then you will be differentiated function f with respect to s, and that's not very nice. <coughs> it's not immediate how you can gain the 2 to the minus k by integrating by part. And this is the kind of difficulty that arises because of the presence of right behavior in this IPK. This is exactly because you are integrating only over a lower dimensional submanifold in, in, in y earlier that, 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 that causes this problem. So I just want to end by saying that turns out what comes to our rescue is another TT star mm -hmm. argument. So another TT star argument allows us to uh, linearize things, which have more variables of integration, allows us to integrate by part, and that is uh, how we actually finish the proof. Okay, I guess that's it. Thank you very much. That's exactly right. For example, quadratic uh, part of yes. the That's something we will hope to come back in the, in the near future. Um, so, of course, the next question, the next natural question is to uh, you know, we go back all the way to our main theorem. Well, the question is, can you allow more general polynomial phases? Can you allow terms with, like, let's say, a multiple of y squared, or can you allow even linear phases in this, in this operator? If you want to ever try to tackle that problem, then, then, then time frequency analysis must come into play, and this is something that uh, 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 some of us just need to think about. Can you just go to the point to, I mean, to go back to the, the higher dimensional probability theorem, where you generalize the polynom general polynomial phases. Yes. Okay, so it's a little bit of course, we have this release to go up in the next one. Yes. But uh, what they hope to do is to do this uh, in higher dimensions. I think this is a very interesting problem. Um, my, well, I, I have not actually looked at it carefully, but from what I understood from Victor Lee, I think, I think this is a tractable problem, but I don't know. There might be additional challenges that one has to, because after all, uh, not, not that much is known in, in time frequency analysis in high dimensions. Yeah. There's been a couple of work of Werner Victor and other people who, who have thought about it, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's just something that perhaps is barely beyond the reach of our technology, but we don't, we don't know. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> well, there are, this is just one version of the theorem that we have, actually. For instance, I can prove the following uh, theorem. If I take the supremum over all p in the following class, so let's say p is a combination of y1 cube plus, let's say, y2 cube, where lambda 1, lambda 2 are. This is a subset of all polynomials of degree 3 in R2. This is a two-dimensional subspace. Let's say for this one, we can also have a corresponding van der Kolb estimate for the kernel K sharp that I wrote down, and you can still prove the theorem once. There's no problem. But then uh, there are some 
funny dimension tongue that suggests that uh, at least at this moment, it, it seems like that the only thing we can actually handle uh, if you restrict ourselves to polynomials of degree three is a two dimensional space. So if you want a space that's more than two dimensional, then I don't know how to do it. The main, the main obstruction is in this uh, little lemma that I wrote down that I get a chance to explain. Uh, we want to have this lemma for, for uh, the class of polynomial faces that we put up here. And uh, so no time actually to explain what it is at the moment, but, but one thing is that we've got to make these exceptional sets to be independent of the second polynomial phase PQ. So the k-sharp depends on both polynomials that we want to. We want to have a polynomial that, uh, well, I have accepted that it's independent of the second polynomial P2. So that, that, that is something that we don't know. How to oh. huh? We don't know, we don't know, we don't know. Might be true, might as well be true. So we just don't know. But that's a very good question. Something one certainly got to address. But maybe when you, well, I guess part of my hope is that if you do time frequency analysis properly, you don't need to deal with this problem. Thank you.